Thank you for coming to today's event. My name is Nick, and I'm one of the events hosts here at Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our, out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. You can also find information about our live events there, too, as well. If you don't already do so, please follow us on our social media channels via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube. Um, tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Dan Cheon in conversation with Sean Vestal, talking about Dan's new book, Sleepwalk. Dan Cheon is the author of six previous books, including Among the Missing, a finalist for the National Book Award. And uh, Cheon's fiction has appeared in the Best American Short Stories, the Pushcart Prize anthologies, and the O. Henry Collection. In his, in his latest work, Sleepwalk, Will Bear is a man with many aliases who at 50 years old has been living off the grid for over half of his life, never having a real job or paid taxes or been in a committed relationship. A good natured henchman with a complicated and lonely, lonely past and a passion for LSD microdosing, he spends his time hopscotching across state lines in his beloved camper van, running sometimes shady, often dangerous errands for a very powerful, ruthless opera operation he's never troubled himself to learn too much about. He has lots of connections, but no true ties, until out of the blue, one of Will's many burner phones heralds a call from a 20-year-old woman claiming to be his biological daughter, and she needs his help. Uh, let's see. Gazing both back to the past and forward into an inevitably long-seeming future, Sleepwalk examines where we've been and where we're, going, where we're going and the connections that bind us, no matter how far we travel to dodge them or how cleverly we hide. Um, Dan will be joined in conversation by Sean Vestal, author of uh, the novel Daredevils and Godforsaken Idaho, a story collection that won the 2014 Penn Robert Bingham Prize and was shortlisted for the Saroyan Prize. His uh, stories have appeared in Tin House, Ecotone, McSweeney's, The Southern Review, and many other journals. So. Today's event will include an audience Q&A, so please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, if someone has typed a question you'd also like to know the answer to, please upload that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Lastly, support Dan and Powell's by purchasing a copy of his books from us. Uh, a link to buy Sleepwalk will be shared in the chat a couple of times. All right, Dan and Sean, thank you so much for joining us. We're thrilled to have you here. Thank you. Um, I'm actually sitting on the floor at a hotel room in Denver um, and uh, the air conditioner just went on, but hopefully you can hear me. I'm going to read from the first chapter of Sleepwalk. The first time it happens, it's October, and I'm driving through Utah with this young Filipino guy named Leandro. We're passing a joint back and forth, handing off over the head of Flip the dog, who is asleep on the seat in between us, but we're not really talking. Leandro is miffed because his ankles are shackled. I picked him up at the Chef Ching Diner in Elko, Nevada, and I told him then that it was just best practices, nothing personal. I had him sit down in the passenger seat of the pickup and take off his shoes and socks. Then I bent down and applied some cuffs. Dude, he says, flexing his toes, this is so unnecessary. I know it is, I said. Ah, oh, well, I reckon he should be glad he's got his hands free, but he's not grateful in the slightest. He holds the nubbin of joint between his thumb and forefinger with delicate aloofness, takes a long, slow draw, puckers and exhales a little trail of smoke and stares out the window as if I'm not even there. I hope he's enjoying the view. We're driving through the Bonville salt flats and he might as well be looking at a blank screen. I hold out my hand and he passes the joint back without glancing at me. Tiny glinting raindrops are sidling along the parts of the windshield that the wipers don't reach. And I, up ahead, see a piece of sleet turn into a snowflake. It's falling and then suddenly it becomes a weightless piece of fluff. Now it's flying like it just grew wings. Looks like it's gonna start snowing, I say. Must be from that typhoon they're having up to Seattle. Huh, Leandro says. And he is about as interested as any of us are in hiring a 50-year-old white man chat about the weather. At that moment, one of the burner phones I keep in a plastic sand bucket next to the gear shift lights up. 
is set to vibrate and it starts jiggling and flashing and bumping against the others. I reach down and fish around for it, pick it up and flip it open. Yellow, I say. Hello, says a chipper young female voice. Can I speak to Will Bear? I reach down the window and toss the phone out. In the side mirror, I see it hit the surface of the interstate and bust apart shards of plastic and metal bouncing like marbles. Leandro looks over his shoulder wistfully. Dude, he says, why did you do that? Nobody's supposed to call me on that phone, I tell him. He blows on the lid end of his joint that it has gone out. Such a waste, he says. You could have given it to me. I don't got a phone. Second time it happens, I get a little prickle of concern. I have nine phones in that bucket and they all, they're all supposed to be anonymous. I guess I'm looking at some sort of breach. It could be a robocall. Nothing is safe from those. I dip my hand in the bucket and root around for the little vibrating rattlesnake egg and snatch it up. Hello, I say, and dang, if it isn't the same young female voice. Hi, she says, talking fast. Mr. Baird, you don't know me, but don't hang up. I have important information for you, which is super alarming. I toss the phone out the window again and Leandro looks at me sidelong. Problems, boss, he says. The third time it happens, we're pulled over by the side of the road. Visibility has gone to hell. The sleep flakes are blowing in a horizontal stream like video static. And then a phone at the top of the bucket starts trembling and jostling. Leandro doesn't look. He's mesmerized by the storm outside, by the freshly rolled joint he's sipping at. For a while, I think I'm not, I'm just gonna wait it out. The phones aren't set up for voicemail, so I can just leave the thing ring and ring. Three minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, let the dang thing hum for an hour, I don't care. But then another of the burner phones starts to buzz, and then another, and then all eight of them. Bill Bear, Bear Williams, Barry Billingsley, Wilder Barr, Blair Willingham, Liam Barr, even Willie Bear Jr all the names and identities that make up my barely blur, all of them zuzzing and trembling and shuffling around in the bucket like cicadas on their backs. And I seized one furiously. Who is this? I say. <laughs> all right, well, that's it. That's wonderful. I, uh, there's so much that I admire about this book and I, hearing you read from it, it makes me just want to start with the humor of it. Um, and I guess I don't want to denigrate any of your past work, which I am a big fan of, but, um, it seems like it's your funniest. I, I don't know. I wonder. Well, I mean, most of the other ones aren't funny really at all. <laughs> <laughs> that was my thought too, but I didn't want to, you know, overlook some unnoticed humor. Um, right. So any, is this something that you just thought I'd like to try for that note or how did, how did that develop as part of this? Well, you know, I mean. There was, a, there was a period after Ill Will where I had just become the scary guy. And people, like, people would say, I really loved your book, but it scared me and kept me up at night. Or I couldn't finish it because it was so disturbing. And you know, like I did an interview and somebody was like, what's your favorite scary book? Um, and I was like, well, I, have, I, am, I mean, I do think of myself as, as someone who, has, who writes horror. Um, and enjoys it but I also want to be a writer who can do a whole variety of different genres and that was sort of the impetus here I wanted to do something lighter and funnier um, and try to and try to figure out a different uh, a different tactic interesting because I mean when I hear people describe the book the first thing that comes to mind isn't um, like laugh riot you know what I mean like there's grim things going on in the book yeah and, um, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess the voice is, is where a lot of that is located. And uh, I, I think of two phrases. One is dang or dang it. Maybe mm -hmm. I would just ask you about dang or dang it and the, the, how effective it can be to do, to use that as opposed to have him curse. Is, was the, that seems like a mindful choice maybe. Oh, it really, I mean, I, I didn't want, well, I wanted, to sort of emphasize a certain kind of um, innocence or like old fashioned politeness in, in Will. And so I, I said, when I set it out, I, I wanted um, 
not him not to use any or 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 very few uh, actual swear words and to kind of use some of the old fashioned uh, slang uh, like "dang it" and um, that kind of thing. Uh, okay. Just to I, I guess to kind of soften some of his edges because he is a hitman. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I have to say, though, every time I came across Dang It, uh, it did make me laugh. Um, and there, I don't know why that was, but I guess it's just the, the innocence, the undercutting of the, of the darkness, perhaps. Um, you know, the, the book is different in other ways from your other books. Stylistically, it's, it's different from your, uh, from, yeah, uh, certainly from Ill Will and Await Your Reply, which have more... Um, elaborate perhaps narrative structures or, or at least there's more kind of chopping up of time and that kind of thing more perspectives um i'm curious how that came to be if it was a you decided you wanted to write in a certain style or or if that just the voice took over or what how did that come well to be? i mean i mean part of it was the voice for sure um but there was also you know like i had written several books that were you know, extremely complicated structurally and covered a lot of different time periods, a lot of different uh, point of views. And I wanted to kind of try something that was hard, but like would, would not be sort of like obviously flashy. And um, working, a, like doing a novel in first person present tense is, is actually really hard. Um, and it's, it, so, so there was that challenge. I'd never done it before, um, I'd never, I, I rarely use first person anyway. Um, and also to, to write a novel that took place over a period of about, you know, three weeks, as opposed to, you know, like my other books, which take place, you know, over multiple decades, usually. Yeah. You know, I actually jotted this down listening to another interview, you did this comment similar to what you just said. Writing a novel in first person present tense is fucking hard. <laughs> I believe I'm <laughs> quoting you. And I remember thinking as a young writer, that, that was the natural, easy way to write. But I, it, why, why is it hard? Why, what, why is it so hard? Um, I guess because you're, because you're sort of constantly in the present moment. So it's hard to, I mean, it's, it's hard to move around. Um, and it, you know, it means, it sort of means that you're, that you're stuck a little bit um, in, in scene, um, you're you're stuck in sort of you're, you're taking away some of your toolboxes to some mm -hmm. to some extent, um, and um, you're in some ways forcing a little bit more of a cinematic uh, structure onto onto the onto the page because you know really you have to work in scene pretty much the whole time. Yeah. Um, you mean you can have flashbacks, but uh, you're constantly sort of up against the, the clock, you know, in a, in a weird way. Yeah. yeah. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you about was like when the book is like, it feels like there's elements of a future. It also feels like, you know, there's elements of a alternative present, perhaps I, you know, I, um, right. it feels like it might be next year kind of terrifyingly, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, think I think it's, yeah. I, I guess I think it's more like an alternate present yeah. um, because I mean the, a lot of the culture references will like point to it being about about now um, just in terms of what you know like what music he's listening to 20 right. years ago or whatever um, and part of that was just like confusion about how to write about contemporary life and not being sure that you know like I mean, this has always this has always been a problem in this century, where you know the technology is changing so fast, and the you know politically things are changing so fast that you don't know um, what contemporary will look like in you know like two years after you're finished with the book. Um, and so I just just started exaggerating things that were already in the news, um, and you know like maybe taking things from uh, like places where authoritarianism had taken over a little bit more than it has here um, and places where there were more, you know, um, disasters than we have, but then we have actually experienced so far. Um, but I guess I've been telling people that it's, you know, 
one or two pandemics away and one or two constitutional crises away, um, one or two like major environmental disasters away from now, um, which like you said, could be next week. Yeah. Well, I, uh, one of the things I admire about it is there's a light hand in terms of uh, explaining everything. Like, I think it's clear the nature of the disasters, plural, you know, but right. um, um, I, I guess I wondered if, if you had a, uh, uh, a more kind of particular schema for, for what had gone wrong and how, or if it was just sort of a variety of things. I, I mean, I, I, I think of it as a, as a variety of things. And I also think that um, part of what I like about this character's voice is that he's, he's more or less oblivious to what's, to what's going on. Not, not oblivious, but he's only thinking about it as it, as it relates to his current situation. Um, so, you know, you, you may have noticed that, the, that um, he briefly talked about a typhoon up to Seattle and my copy editor said, there's no typhoons in Seattle. And my reply was, not yet. Um, <laughs> so, but I mean, I, I, one of the things I was thinking of was that meme with the with the dog drinking coffee in the in the burning coffee shop, and the dog's thinking this is fine. And I guess I wanted that, that to kind of be Will's attitude as he's passing through these things. Is you know they're there. Um, you know, later on, in, a couple chapters later, he's he's driving along and like stuff starts raining out of the sky that. He's not sure what it is. He thinks it might be um, like ashes from a volcanic eruption, but he doesn't really know. Um, yeah. And I think there are things like that throughout the book where it's just, I mean, it's just passing by, um, but it gives the reader a sense of, you know, something really screwed up has happened. Uh -huh. um, and I, I like, I, I kind of like leaving the world building a little bit off to the side so that it, I mean, by the time you notice it, you've already been sort of seduced into the into the into the world of the story. Yeah. Well, um, I imagine that you. Oh, I'm sorry. You, oh, I mean, I guess that's... the only thing I was going to say is like um, when when they were writing the copy for the book, you know, I really was trying to get them not to use the word dystopian or, you know, whatever. But right. you know, just because I wanted the, that part to be a, a little bit of a surprise. Um, but it, it ended up on the on the cover anyway. So, yeah. well, it's so much more effective to me, and I know that there may be kind of editorial voices who want to more fully understand more immediately. Um, and I'm glad that like a typhoon in Seattle does a lot of work in my view. like um, and um, work that would be undercut by more exactitude, I think, by by explanation. But anyway, that's not a question. That's just me me rambling. Um, I wanted to ask about tone again. We touched on it a little bit um, earlier, and, and um, you mentioned, and, and I guess by that it's voice, really, the, the, the mm -hmm. tone is about the voice. You, you note that some of the model for the voice is, is based on your dad, your biological dad. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I guess I'd just like to hear more about that and the way that that if it originated there or if it was a way for you to sort of expand upon it or deepen it or how did that happen? Well, I mean, I guess um, there was, my, my, my dad has this really fun, had, I mean, he, he, he passed away a, a few years ago, but he had this really funky voice. I mean, he was an Iowa farm boy who um, moved to, to LA in the, in the sixties. And so he had this really, strange combination of like um LA surfer stoner and you know um Iowa redneck um mixed together and I would often just write down like hilarious things that he said and I had this whole collection of things and I I found myself using them and yeah I did want to kind of evoke uh, evoke them after his death and and be close to him in a way um but um also, it, it just seemed like a way to kind of play with um, with humor and with um, making this like dystopic world um, 
sort of more palatable in some ways. I mean, both, I guess both the collection Stay Awake and, um, and Ill Will were really pretty nihilistic and, you know, bleak books. And I wanted, I guess, because things are so nihilistic and bleak right now in real it, IRL, um, I wanted to give this book some some kind of like heart and hope um, in a way that I didn't feel was necessary in in a book like Ill Will. I really felt like this book needed to have this uh, this movement towards somebody waking up and 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 finding like compassion and a need for connection and all these things and um, and becoming a better person. Yeah. I mean, I feel like he does. I mean, not. He, I mean, it's not the the transformation is not complete at the end, but I do feel like he discovers some uh, some morality or something. Yeah, I did as a reader, and I, and I I I connected with him continually as a child and a parent, like in all the various. Of course, my life is not like his life, you know, but um, that that stuff was really potent. It seemed like parenthood, maybe this is too obvious to, to ask, but it seems like that was really a, you know, a, on your mind in terms of, you know, where, to, where do we find whatever we can find in the hard times? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll also, I've always wanted to try to, to try to write about um, the complicated um, emotional aspect of meeting uh, someone who's biologically related to you, a biological parent, when you're an adult, and how there is this sense of connection and this sense of urgency about meeting, or at least there was for me, that's very hard to explain to somebody that's never experienced that. And I wanted, I wanted to try to like figure out a way to get at that um, in, you know, outside of autobiography, which I'm not particularly interested in. Mm -hmm. It, I guess I would say that I emerged from it feeling like the book was made a case, not any kind of didactics for the case, but that, that, that there is something, there is something that's, that's in the nature of us, that's beyond the nurture, if you want to simplify it to those yeah. two elements. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, um, that's, that was sort of what, one of the things I was, I was driving at, I guess. Yeah. Do you... Uh, did you have other books or movies, other kinds of art that you um, that either inspired this or that you s came to see as kind of this fitting in a tradition of or a lineage of? Well, I mean, you know, I was certainly interested in the in in the road movie and the road novel um, and in noir to some extent. I mean, there's there's quite a bit of Jim Thompson under the surface of this, I, I feel like, um, especially in his relationship with his mother, there's a, there's a lot of the grifters. Um, there's a, there, I mean, there's a touch of the Big Lebowski. Um, if like, I guess if the Big Lebowski worked for a, a corporation that, that called out hits on people. Um, and, um, you know, definitely I, I was, I mean, in terms of structure, I was thinking of various kinds of, of sort of subverting various kinds of noir because there is, uh, you know, there is a, a detective story here at a crime story. Um, and also, you know, sort of like a private eye kind of person digging into things that he shouldn't be digging into. Um, to some extent, um, his, his daughter plays the role of the femme fatale that, you know, you would see in a noir. Um, so, you know, you don't know whether, whether, um, to trust her or not. You don't know whether she, she's like going to stab him in the back in the end. Um, so all that, I mean, I think all that stuff was that, that genre structural stuff was on my mind for sure. Uh, so it, it doesn't seem to me that you're, uh, resistant of or, or precious about genre discussions when it comes to your work. Oh, no, no. I mean, my main thing is like, I want to be able to, to, to write in all the genres before I die or, you know, as many as I can, because I really, I really love like being able to explore different ways of telling a story. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I like to read in, in, in a lot of different 
in a lot of different genres and a lot of different uh, uh, styles. So I, I feel like sometimes we get pigeonholed a little bit too quickly and you know, you're this kind of writer or that kind of writer. Um, and you know, in some ways that's, that's commercial. I mean, that's a commercial decision um, that you know, the publisher wants you to stay in this, especially if, if something has been successful, they want you to stick with that. Um, but I, I feel like for a writer that being the best thing for me is to have different, con different types of containers that I can, you know, sort of use to explore my, my fairly limited number of obsessions. Hmm. Cause I don't have, I mean, I guess I don't have a huge lot of things to write about, but I want to write about the same thing in a lot of different ways. <laughs> what would you say your obsessions are? <laughs> your fairly limited number of obsessions. Well, I mean, I think I, identity, the question of nature and nurture, just dysfunctional families, um, and how people become the way they, you know, how they, how people become who they are, um, adoption, uh, foster care, birth families, um, that appears in all my books. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's a, a few things that are interconnected that I, that, um, that I go back to a lot. Yeah. Um, and they're autobiographical things, but I, you know, um, but like I said, I don't really want to write autobiographical work. Were there particular genres that at a young age that were important to you and making you a reader and then eventually a writer. Maybe it didn't go that way. I assume it did. Usually, yeah. No, way. I mean, I, I was. I mean, as a kid, I was. I was into um, horror, as science fiction, and fantasy pretty much exclusively. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, when I went to college, um, I got introduced to you know like literary writers like like Raymond Carver and Alice Munro and Joy Williams, and you know. For a while, I feel like I tried um, to to just sort of escape my background as a as as somebody who really grew up loving Ray Bradbury and Shirley Jackson and Patricia Highsmith and you know Alfred Hitchcock presents and whatever um, and you know just be a straight up literary writer. But the the more I I grew as a writer, the more that that felt like a straitjacket and the fit wasn't great. Um, and, and I became more interested in trying to bring in, you know, like murder and mayhem and magic and scary stuff and, you know, fantasy elements uh, and, 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 and use the stuff that I really loved. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm hoping eventually to write a Western and uh, a, a fantasy, a straight up high fantasy novel, maybe, and then maybe a rom-com to, huh. to just finish it all off. Yeah, nice. like yeah do you have a particular i don't know if strategy is the right word but but uh, uh values or characteristics that are important if you're going to sort of take on the genre to make it your own to to sort of make it as fresh as you can within the, the tradition well yeah i mean I, I feel like you have to you have to know the genre and you have to be i mean you have to know it from a loving space as opposed to just you know like you're a snob and oh i've read one science fiction novel and now i'm gonna you know i'm gonna turn the genre on its head forget it you know there's there's right. many people that have done that already i mean i think what you want to do is you want to take what you love about that genre and make it your own and 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 sort of um you know send out a pseudopod and 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 like bring the genre into your into your writerly world so you know if if it's a science fiction novel and also it's recognizable as a sean vestal novel then that's that's what i i would want to see from you for example yeah i mean there there are science fiction novels that only you could write and that's what i'd want Kind of trying actually, but well, I, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think you know a lot of what you bring to your work is the same thing that a great literary writer brings to the work. You know, it's just sort of uh, real excellence on the line. You know, um, attention to sort of character. For me, it's like there has to be kind of that Kafka's axe going on somewhere, right? Right, so right. Breaking open the sea. Um, and um, 
I do. Do you feel like there's a, you know, I got my MFA kind of later in life. My, I was in my forties. And um, I think maybe the idea in, in those circles was kind of coming to an end, this sort of strict, these sort of strict divisions. I don't know. Do you, I feel like maybe some of that's coming down now. I feel like, I feel like it is to yeah. some extent. Um, although, you know, um, I, I still sense a lot of um, sort of snobbery about particular genres. I mean, horror in particular gets a bad rep, uh, you know, and I think some of the, some of the, the horror novelists that I, that I read are, are extraordinary prose stylists and they're doing really in, intense and interesting work um, that has, that's about the human connection and about, you know, big big things um and um i do feel like there's they're like they're sometimes like treated as second class citizens still but i you know at the same time i think there are writers who have um you know brought speculative and fantasy elements into the mainstream more i mean um jennifer egan's uh two books that the 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 um, visit to the Goon Squad and the Candy House are both, you know, science fiction in in a lot of in in many ways. Um, Emily Mandel's book is has has science fiction elements. Um, uh, the, you know, there's just I mean, there's a ton of writers uh, who have like you know, big time literary cred that are that are working in those forms now. So I feel like there's like less of a stigma for sure. Yeah. Um, are there any horror writers you would like throw out for those of us who are underread in that genre? <laughs> um, I, have, I don't read, you know, King when I was a kid. Beyond that, probably almost none. Yeah. Well, I mean, the 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 other I think major figure that 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 was super important to me, um, and that I wish was 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 more widely read by. Um, by literary people is Peter Straub because I think he's an extraordinary oh, yeah. uh, literary writer and someone who does, you know, incredible things with um, with structure and with you know writing about grief and about you know and about loss and uh, I would recommend uh, the the Blue Rose trilogy which starts with the novel Coco um, if you if you're looking at his, if you're looking at his work I mean that's that that sequence of three novels uh, is, is it's, it's Coco, The Throat and Mystery. Are there I mean, just really, really extraordinary. Um, there's, you know, uh, Stephen Graham Jones, who I think is, 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 a, is a wonderful prose stylist. I mean, he, you know, he, his, his first books were with uh, Fiction Collective, uh, which is, you know, much more experimental arty writing and now he does these you know these sort of fun things um like the uh um the only good indian is is a, is a great place to start with his with his work um uh paul tremblay i think is 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 doing stuff that where there's a relationship between literary and uh genre horror effects you know like he has his uh um you know he has a he has a kind of zombie novel he has a kind of um found footage novel um and yeah so i mean those are those are those are some people that i think of right off the top of my head um okay um, um victor victor labelle i would also mention victor labelle oh yeah wow okay. not victor olivia victor laval no, right. still didn't. Yeah, no, they got it. They got it. Oh, is that wrong somewhere? I was going to say. No, I think it's. it's I mean, it's when we're in the transcript. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Right. Um. Uh, I I I saw. I was going to ask you about the title and how that you know why that works for you as a title and whether there were other um, contenders along the way. Do you, does that come late for you or does that come early? That, I mean, sometimes it comes late. If it, if, it, if it comes late, that's a bad thing because then it means I'm going to struggle for, the, for like a long time to find the right title. This was, the, the Sleepwalk was the first, was the first thing that I, I had with this book. Um, it was, it was the first, 
I had the title before I had any, almost anything in the book. Um, and part of it was, you know, like that old Frank, uh, that old Santo and Johnny song. Um, it, it's like sort of uh, slow surf rock, uh, if, if, if that's a thing. Um, but the mood of that is kind of um, noir and insinuating and but also like I mean there's there's like ro it's like rolling down a lazy river but it's also like got that kind of uh David Lynch uh creepy quality to it huh. um and I I, I like and, and that it was it was like that sound that I wanted the novel to evoke um but it also you know it's I mean thematically I guess it's I wanted to, t I mean, it, it, it signals that I wanted to talk about what, what's going on with all of us right now, which is this um, ability that we, that we are exercising of being able to ignore how dire uh, the world is around us, you know? And I mean, we can, you know, have uh, snow in Mexico city and, um, we can drop our kids off at school, at school after horrible things. And uh, it's, it's an amazing ability, but I really wanted to write about what, what that, I guess, I guess what that feels like to be in that state of mind where you're dissociated from, uh, from what's really happening. Um, and, you know, there's, I, I think there's a, a, a point in the novel where Will says, um, that um, accepting reality is uh, it requires a suspension of disbelief, um, and that I mean I think that 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 pretty much sums up the, the where the title comes from. Yeah. <laughs> um, then I might ask a question from a reader here, um, and this is from Mary Carp. Mary asks, "Can you talk a bit about Will's relationship?" To his dog flip as opposed to his human relationships yeah well the, his dog is 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 a big part of the story um and you know flip has his, is 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 a is a major character in his own right he's a he's a rescue pit bull um and there's a backstory about how will came to came to get him um but i think will imbues him with all of the affection and um personality that uh he does he he is, he isn't able to he, he isn't able to to sort of give to anybody else and so they develop this very deep and sort of abiding bond and uh will often will remark on what what flip is thinking and anybody that knows that that has a dog knows what that's like i mean you know what your dog is thinking and sometimes your dog is judging you sometimes your dog is thinks you're hilarious sometimes they're really disgusted by you and that i think that's the case in the in the relationship between will and 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 his dog flip yeah um there was another one i wanted to ask from q a let me um and jude brewer asks this that what are the ideal conditions for someone about to be, sorry, what are the ideal conditions for someone about to be reading Sleepwalk? Oh, I think you should be on an isolated beach somewhere. Um, that would be, that would be, that'd be a nice place to be. I think you could also really have a nice time if you were like driving across the country and listening to it on audio, particularly if you're driving on, let's say, uh, Interstate 80 across, you know, Nevada, Wyoming, Nebraska, Iowa. <laughs> um, but yeah, you could read it in the bathtub, or what? I don't know what what do Portland people do? They they read in the rain and um, with an umbrella, maybe under a bridge. Right. Yep. Yeah. Are you a fan of audiobooks? You like to listen to I love them. Yeah. I love them. Um, and I know that some people are like, 
well, you can't count that as reading, but I do. And um, I do a lot of driving. I do a lot of traveling. Um, and so, I mean, I, I feel like I get, I get experience with a lot of different types of books that I might not, uh, I might not have time to read at home. Uh, I mean, the only, the only problem with an audiobook is that sometimes a reader can make or break it in a way that, um, you know, like I've had, I've had books that I really love, but I can't listen to them on audio because the actor is too um, squirrely, too vibrant um, and takes over and wants to, wants to play every part. And, you know, um, I, I really don't like it when people like, when there's like a, a reader who has, who has to do different voices for every character. Um, but uh and I also don't like the ones that are that are too robotic either. Um, but other than that, I, I feel like that it's a, like being read to is is just such a blessed experience. Um, it's like being in the womb again. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, do you, re do you mostly in the car, or do you also listen to them? I li yeah, I, I I listen to audiobooks when I'm doing chores. Um, I listen to audiobooks when I'm making dinner. Um, sometimes like. It, it, I'll, I'll listen to a few chapters before I go to sleep. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, it's like a big part of my, um, of my reading experience. And not, not to say that I don't read books on the page because there's some books that I absolutely feel like deeply attached to as, um, uh, as experiences on, on the page as well. So you taught, right, for a good number of years. Yeah, Are I just retired. I retired in 2018. Okay. Yeah. Um, I um, well, how did those? How did the teaching and the writing interact with each other? Did they? How did they? How did those two occupations affect one another? Well, I mean, I I loved my students, and I learned an enormous amount from them, and I learned an enormous amount teaching creative writing, because I would often be talking about problems that I myself was, was struggling with as a writer. Um, I mean, the hard thing is there's, you know, like there's a, a real immediate uh, reward to, you know, like reading a student's work and commenting on it and giving them feedback. And the, I mean, in some ways that sometimes would take away from my, from, from my writing my own work um, because, you know, you'd, 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 you can skip a night of writing your own work, but you can't skip a night of reading somebody else's when you got to talk about it the next day. Um, and so, I mean, I feel like in some ways after I retired, I was able to sort of step back and put my own work on the front burner in a way that I hadn't been able to before. Um, and that's not to say that I don't miss my students. Um, I do, but I, I actually don't miss academia very much at all, yeah. to be honest. Um, okay. I can see that. <laughs> I can imagine that's, it. That's, yeah. that's, that's, a, that's another story. For, yeah. um, but I will not be writing an academic novel ever. <laughs> no. That's one, that's one genre I'm, I'm, I'm leaving out. All right. Um, well, you and I met where we taught at a writer's conference. And talking to you and hearing about the way you taught had a it really influenced me in the little teaching that I did. And it turned me away from a workshop heavy orientation right. and toward a creative, and this is other people did this as well, but toward really helping people create versus just criticizing what they had already created. Right. Um, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, like, I'm really oh. not sure how, how, how useful that is for the people whose work is being you know, is being critiqued. Um, it, I mean, the critique part is helpful for the people who are doing the crit critique because it, it's asking them to look closely at what choices writers make. And that's a, I think that's a really valuable thing. I think it's less valuable and sometimes often quite damaging for the person whose, whose work is being examined. Um, you know, they walk away from, from the dissection table and, and they've lost a couple pieces on, along, the, along the way. Yeah. Do you, I might remember this wrong, but I was under the impression that you might kind of give yourself 
assignments in a similar way that you might have given a student assignment. It's like give yourself a prompt and put yourself on a clock. Do you do things like that? I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I really very frequently work with, um, with exercises, with timers, um, and it's all just a part of, you know, part of the, a process of trying to get outside of, of the, you know, the critical apparatus that's often at, at the very front of your brain or at the, at the executive, um, uh, the executive function of your brain is, is, is always trying to su shut down that sort of play, that playful um, part um, and that, that, that sort of subconscious part that you need to get access to as a writer. Um, so I'm just trying to find different ways to do it. Um, and, you know, I find timed exercises, music, um, different kinds of technical uh, assignments to get myself all help. I had another question from, a, well, I guess it went away. Someone had asked, and I'll, I'll just steal this question and ask it. Um, I saw a question from Pete Rock. I did too, and I wondered, the Pete Rock? Anyway, I um, it, it was something along the lines of how does revision work for you? Like, I would just sort of ask, like, do you write quickly and revise a lot? Or I don't know, what is that process like for you, the revising and editing? Um, well, I I write all by longhand. My first draft is all is pretty much all longhand, um, oh. and then uh, I'll. I'll, I'll put it in, I'll, I'll put it into the computer at, at, you know, in maybe the sort of the second draft stage. Um, and then I'll usually, I'll usually print it out and go longhand again, because I feel like um, for me at least, and this may be just because I didn't grow up uh, using a word processing program. Um, there's something about trying to edit on the computer that never works for me. I can't, see I can't see the work um and I can't see the mistakes for some reason and the you know the process of just taking it and and right and taking the something I've written by hand typing it in printing it out and then then recopying it and changing it along uh as I as I recopy it seems to help me in in the revision process I mean, I, I know I, I had some students where, where I tried to make them do that and they just, it was, it was too much for them. They couldn't do it. Um, they, and I think, they I, mean, I think fewer, fewer people um, have the experience of writing by hand um, as, uh, as a regular thing. So it, it's just weird for them. Yeah. I, f I find that a lot of people don't, um, I don't know. That's almost fearful. They don't revise <clears throat> deeply. Like you're talking about almost just putting it through the typewriter again. Or actually you are. Right. In a different way. Yeah. yeah. So you have to revise it because you're putting the words down again. I guess you don't yeah. have to. Anyway. I mean, that's, I mean, I think you have to, I mean, it's like you have to run your hands over the surface of it a few times before you even are able to understand what, what it is that you've written. Um, and I guess, to be like like copying something or rewriting it in, in by hand and then typing it is a way of just sort of like um, tactilely exploring the you know the the text tactilely. Yeah, I don't know how I would say that. I <laughs> I got you though. Um, do you, um, do you still find yourself drawn towards stories at all? Do you ever find yourself uh, writing oh, stuff? I do, I do, but um, it just is such a, you know, it's it's a hard thing. I I mean, I've been under contract to write novels for, for so many years, and you know, I, I get to sneak in a story every once in a while when I have a, when I have an extra moment. Um, but you know, people don't want to publish that, yeah. really. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't feel any, I don't feel any, 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 um, any encouragement um, to do so. I've got, I've got another collection that's pretty close to done, um, but I think I'll pro it'll, it'll probably be a ways down the line before I'm able to actually publish it. 
Um, is that your experience too, Sean? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I've slowed, I mean, I just, it's just a little part of my life. And so when, if I'm working on a novel idea, then that really takes that up. And um, yeah, nobody, I mean, it's like you said, is, that's a perfect way to put it. Sort of suck everything into themselves. Yeah. And the world doesn't, no, nobody out there is like Sean, would you write another short story? They're right. not like Sean, would right. you write another X either, but you know, there's more, it's closer to that. <laughs> right, right, right. And, um, but, and, and I also, having written a number of them, uh, I don't know, I'm really looking for something new to spark something, you know, mm -hmm. so there's that as well. Um, you know, I know, um, you had I, I have this memory of you making some pop culture recommendations to me three, two or three years ago or whenever that was that really uh, one was like playing video games, which I hadn't really done. So I played Skyrim as a result of it. And I oh, got yay. super yay. into video games <laughs> and uh, Game of Thrones, which I had maybe snobbily turned my nose up at and then uh, just gobbled it up, just consumed it in one big gulp. Um, so I just thought it, you're kind of a like an influencer in that way. I wondered if you just <laughs> what it is you're out there in the world, what book, music, game, whatever that uh, that's uh, that you like right now. Um. Well, let's. I mean, there's. I mean, there, there's just a a ton of stuff that I, that I'm that I'm enjoying. Um, man, I'm, I'm loving the new season of Barry. I'm loving the new season of um, Made to Love. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, I enjoyed the, the new season of Stranger Things. And um, in terms of video games, I played Elden Ring starting in February, but that is not a fun game. That's a mean, hard game that just <laughs> made me sad the whole time. Um, and finally I gave up because I, I couldn't even kill one one um one boss all i did was run around picking flowers and collecting coins um but i know a lot of i mean i mean it, it was it was it was something that everybody was doing so it was sort of fun in that way at the time to be part of a you know like a community of people that were all talking about the same thing and that's i mean that's fun um i saw the new cronenberg movie which is hilarious that's great um i'd, I'd recommend that one um, well, I wouldn't recommend it to everybody, but if you like Cronenberg, you like scary, you like kind of weird, scary, gross stuff that it's, it's, it's like the perfection of that. Ah, it definitely looks weird, scary and gross. I wasn't sure I was picking up on the hilarity. hilarity vibes. Well, you know, yeah. that's, that's, that's one of my problems. I mean, you were, you were saying how, um, uh, sleepwalk. You 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 thought there was a lot of disturbing stuff in it, and I was like, "Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I guess you're right." Um, because I often don't pick up on on those things. And I mean, you know, I'll, when my sons some, sometimes hate to go to horror movies with me because I'll I'll be the like the only person in the audience who's laughing. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting is I love I love all that kind of dark stuff, and I meant more like when I hear people describe what's in the book itself. It right. doesn't feel like the experience of being in the book itself, which in which you're often amused, you're often sort of emotionally engaged. Uh, you know, it. it um, anyway, that's me over explaining. But um, are we? Let's see. I was going to make sure I don't overlook any any questions. Well, those were, I think, the questions that I had. I wonder if there's anything I you want to mention that I haven't brought up. Um, Maybe tell us what might be up next for you if you know yet. Um, yeah, I'm I'm working on a I, I'm working on a western. I don't have a title for it yet, um, but it takes place in about 1915 in um, sort sort of like the uh, the real old west area. So it's it's in Colorado, Wyoming, South Dakota, um, and these two orphan children. Um, join a traveling carnival, um, and uh, they have a they have a secret, and things proceed from there. Um, but yeah, I mean, so I'm 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 playing with like 
some like kind of Western elements, some, you know, dark fantasy elements, maybe a little bit of, uh, you know, um, gothic uh, Ray Bradbury's something with the wicked this way comes kind of it's kind of stuff um i'm having a great time with this so far nice. um well that sounds wonderful as a fan of the western but uh, i'm intrigued yeah it's i mean it's going to be i mean i think one of my models is true grit so yeah that's a that's a great one i've uh i've read a lot of bad westerns lately for, for whatever reason i went on a little jag and that's certainly not one of them but you know like vardis fisher's mountain man which is uh, it's not good. I don't recommend not it. Good. No. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. This is I've enjoyed this, and I think that's the questions that I had. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing this, Sean. This was it was it was good to see you. I I, I have not seen you since you grew a beard. <laughs> well, I'm uh, I'm working on a Mormon historical novel, so uh huh. That's what this is about. Okay. Step one. The rest of it's it secret. <laughs> yeah. So, good to see you too. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you both so much for coming today. And uh, yeah, this is the book here, Sleepwalk. Go okay, we'll definitely uh, check this out. I put a link in there if you want to purchase this. So please go and do that. Um, it's very awesome. And also check out uh, check out Sean's books. Here's one of Sean's books here. So and uh, yeah. Um, and uh, while you're there, check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events. We've got lots up ahead in the next coming months. And uh, yeah, we hope to see you all at one again. But once again, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thanks, Dan. So long. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good Bye. Day.